Lucy, thank you very much indeed for reading. Please keep that passage of the Bible open as I welcome you. Page 136 if you've closed the Bible. And uh, there's an outline of today's talk on the back of the notice sheet as well, which may be a help to you. I was uh, once asked to give a talk on the title, What Does Jesus Offer? Uh, What is it that he offers to the world? It was a good talk to work on. It's part of my preparation. I had to stop and think about the salvation that Jesus offers to the world. And it was a good reminder of its amazing quality. Um, I remember being on a a teenage summer camp and they gave out a a little booklet uh, summarizing the Christian message that was called The Best News in the World. And, you know, teenagers like at the time we thought that was a little bit too enthusiastic. There might be something better out there somewhere. But as I came back and prepared that talk, I was reminded just how great the salvation that Jesus offers is. There is nothing like it in terms of the way it meets our need in this life or in the next. Think about this life for a second. You'll know that many speak of there being a, a deep hunger in the human heart. Sigmund Freud said people are hungry for love. Carl Jung said people are hungry for security. Alfred Adler, people are hungry for significance. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Feed on me and you'll never go hungry again. Or again, there are many that walk through life in darkness and disillusion and despair. At the most basic level, they're searching for direction. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Some fearful of death. Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. For others, it's worry, anxiety, fear and guilt. Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So what Jesus is able to offer, even in this life, is insurpassable. But as we were thinking last week, what he offers his followers on the other side of the grave is better yet by far. All sickness and pain gone forever. All temptation gone forever. No more tears, no more death, no more sin. Just a perfect world of joy and delight. And best of all, a completely unbroken relationship with God. Relating to him no longer by faith alone, but by sight. Well, you see, by coming back and thinking about the salvation of Jesus was... So helpful to me. The more you think about what Jesus Jesus offers, the more it it beggars belief that anyone should ever resist him. Imagine if just on a physical level, you could offer sight to the blind. Imagine that you could offer untold riches to the bankrupt. Imagine that you could offer freedom to people who have none and that all of it was absolutely free of charge. Well, no one in their right mind would turn you down. And yet here is Jesus. As he came to earth with the offer of God's salvation in his hands. And his own people didn't so much bite his hand off to get a hold of it. As instead nail his hands to the cross. So our theme is the rejection of Jesus. And in this little uh, mini section of Luke that we started last week, we're being introduced to the public ministry of Jesus. This is his manifesto. This is the mission that he was sent by God into the world to accomplish. And Luke gathers together little episodes from Jesus' life, not in chronological order, but events that are selected to introduce us to some of the big themes that would dominate Jesus' ministry, his mission throughout his life. So last week, right at the heart of everything, he came to preach a message of salvation. Next week, we're going to see that being worked out as we see the unrivaled power of Jesus' words. But today, another theme, that despite all of his grace, despite all that he came to offer, still Jesus was rejected. 
And so you'll see on the sheet that we have two points this morning. The first is the surprising rejection of God by man. And to get a full flavor for what's going on, I'm going to read again from verse 19 this time. Uh, God has sent me, said Jesus, quoting Isaiah, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? So if you're here, you'll remember the setting. Jesus is in the synagogue of his hometown, claiming that God had sent him into the world as the one who was the Lord of all and the conqueror of all and the one who'd come to make God's salvation available to all. And at first blush, it looks as though Jesus is a pretty popular preacher. But that doesn't last long because by the end of verse 22, they're questioning his authority. Isn't he just the son of a carpenter? How can a common man make such extraordinary claims? Some have wondered how the same crowd could switch from being so admiring, it it seems, at the start of verse 22, to being so cynical just a few seconds later, and various theories are put forward. Uh, I suspect the most likely is that they admire Jesus superficially for his rhetoric, but they're much less enamored with his message. It's a reaction that will be uh, familiar to anyone that's ever invited, I guess, people to come to church with them. I've lost count of them a number of times. It's got to the end of a talk. I've asked a, a friend what they've made of it. They've replied, well, I, I thought he was a good speaker. But you probe a little deeper and you say, well, what did you make? Not so much of the messenger, but of the message. And it's a whole different story. Well, I'll say here, great speaker, but who does he think he is? Uh, Jesus responds in verse 23, doubtless you'll quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we've heard you did in Capernaum, do hear in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. He says, I I know what you're going to ask me to do. You'll ask me to perform a sign. You'll want me to do some miracles to prove to you who I am. But I'll tell you what's really going on. Not for the first time in world history. Here is a prophet, me, Jesus, sent from God. And he's not acceptable at home. It means there's a, a great irony going on here. Uh, it's hidden from a slightly in our translation. But in verse 19, Jesus announced that he'd come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, you could translate it the year of the Lord's acceptance. And now in verse 24... No prophet is acceptable, same word, in his hometown. So I'm calling this first point the surprising rejection of God by man because it's so entirely counterintuitive. The living creator God is willing to accept sinful man. But sinful man remains unwilling to accept his God. Well, the question that's been bugging me as I've prepared is, well, what is it about the claim of Jesus that should make the crowd reject him rather than accept him? And I put two parts to the answer on the sheet. First, very simply, the size of his claim. And I think we can have some sympathy with the Jews here. I mean, if I ask you to think of someone that you grew up with, uh, maybe a brother if you, you had one or a family friend, Ask yourself, what would it have taken to convince you that your brother, let's say, was God on earth? Uh, My brother's a nice enough guy. Um, We did occasionally go to church as a family when we were growing up. But if if Mark had wandered to the front in the service one week and stood up at the front and told us that he was God, uh, we wouldn't have been quick to worship him. We would have locked him up pretty quick, I think. There's some sympathy for the congregation here. It's a Sabbath like any other. They've gone to the synagogue. They're busy daydreaming their way through the service, hoping that the Saturday roast won't be burnt when they get home. And then the son of the carpenter stands up. 
Maybe they remember him playing with their children when he was younger. Or when he came around on work experience while his dad fitted their new kitchen. And now in the middle of this sacred and solemn occasion, he takes to his feet in front of everyone and says, you remember that God said he would come to the earth to rid the world of evil and to save his people. Well, here I am. I said last week, there's only so much you can do with a claim like that. What do you make of it? Is he mad? Is he bad? Or is he God? A liar? A lunatic? Or is he Lord? Seems that the sheer size of his claim perplexed them. He's Joseph's boy. How can he make a claim like that? And the question's fine. The problem is the attitude behind the claim. Whenever you're presented with a big claim in life, the sensible thing to do is to ask for the evidence behind the claim and then in the light of that evidence to make a judgment about the, the claim in front of you. That's what we ask people to do when they investigate the Christian faith. Don't just accept it on blind faith because we believe it to be true in the fullest sense of that word. But at the same time, don't just reject it out of hand either. Check out the evidence for yourself. You'll see on the back of the song sheet later, there's a Christianity Explored course advertised. It'll be a terrific place to do that if you want to. The problem here is that the crowd have made a decision not to accept Jesus even before they've really thought through the evidence. They've heard him teach. Verse 23 says that they've suggests that they've heard some rumors about the miracles that he's been doing in Capernaum as well. So they've got some evidence in front of them, but rather than allowing the evidence to lead them to the truth, they've decided that they just don't want to believe. Or whenever I meet someone who's like that today, someone who's rejecting the claim of Jesus without really giving it a hearing. I try to point out to them that they might claim that they're open-minded, but really they're behaving in a way that is non-scientific, irrational, sub-intellectual, and arrogant. That's the first reason that they reject him, the size of his claims. The second is the grace of his words. Glance again at at verse 22. All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And the suggestion is that there was something about the actual words that Jesus spoke that provoked their response. Something to do with the grace of them. Uh, And that idea is strengthened when we realize that marveled is probably too strong a translation here. Actually, most of the other English translations just go with amazed because the uh, original uh, marveled in English suggests a positive response, whereas the original is much more neutral. It could be either positive or negative. So amazed is probably better. And I think that's what's happening here, that it's a negative reaction. They hear the, the words of grace that Jesus spoke and they were shocked by them, appalled, They ask, well, what right does he have to say this stuff? It's all to do with that quotation from Isaiah in verses 18 and 19. And again, if you were here last week, you'll remember that back in Isaiah, the expectation was that God's warrior servant king would arrive on earth with, with two messages. First, for God's people, he would proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But to everyone else, he would proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. And it's fair to say that the Jews of Jesus' day were very keen on both bits of that. Uh, They they loved the idea of salvation for them. Who wouldn't? But they loved the idea that their enemies would be destroyed every bit as much. And you can see why. The Israelites were a very oppressed minority. The Romans have been exploiting them and lording it over them for years. Caesar wanted everyone to call him Lord. And they were supposed to know no other king but Yahweh. And so they they wanted to get their own back. They wanted to 
have a return to the days of the empire and to experience again the, the military and political successes they'd had as a nation under Kings David and Solomon. And they thought that's exactly what God had promised them. But now Jesus appears on the scene and he talks about the year of the Lord's favor and that's great, everyone's nodding. But then he has the audacity to stop before the juicy bit. And he seems to be suggesting that the grace and favor of God is available not just to them, but to everybody, including the Romans. And so they ask, who does he think he is? Two reasons, then, why the crowd take against Jesus, the size of his claims and the grace of his words. It's my experience that still today he's dismissed by many for the same reasons. I was asked to speak once at the um, school of, let me get this right, Oriental and African Studies here in uh, London. The title was, Is Jesus the Only Way to God? And you may know that... um, You'd be hard-pressed to find a more multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious establishment anywhere in London, I guess, than SOAS. And my talk, I discovered when I got there, was due to happen in the, the main room of the student union while everyone was sitting around having lunch, whether they'd been invited along or not. As I stood up to speak, it was very clear to me that if I'd been there that day to say that Jesus was one way to God... Uh, that he was one path up a mountain. And it it didn't really matter which path you follow, so long as you're sincere, because you'll make it to God in the end. I don't think anybody would have objected. Trouble was, I'd agreed to speak from John 14, verse 6, where Jesus says exactly the opposite. There's not a lot of ways you can spin these words in that situation. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His words are deliberately exclusive. He's saying every other way is a dead end. Every other truth claim is a lie. Every other life leads to death. And still today, people hate Jesus for the size of that claim. Or again, whenever I give or go along to a talk on the subject of God's grace and there's a question time afterwards without exception somebody asks are you really telling me that if a convicted murderer repents and believes that Jesus will forgive them and let them into his heaven and when I say that's what Jesus teaches yes if they're sincere in their heart as they come back to him They often say, that's preposterous. I could never believe in a God like that. And what they're saying, of course, is, I don't want God to save those people. I want him to punish those people. And so, just like the Jews, they hate Jesus for the words of grace that come from his mouth. And today we're hearing that that sort of reaction is normal. It's entirely typical of Jesus' ministry. The, uh, the size of his claim and the offer of grace that he gives offend people. They always have. And whenever a church unites behind this mission of Jesus today, we'll find that they always will. We see that reaction magnified in our second point, the shocking acceptance of man by God. And in this bit of the passage, you'll see that Jesus says something so shocking and controversial that the reaction of the synagogue by verse 28 has turned from mild cynicism about his authority to attempted murder. So verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Remember, Jesus grew up among these people. They were close neighbors, family, friends. You have to ask, what could the Prince of Peace have possibly said 
that would make people want to kill him? Well, the answer is in verses 25 to 27. Let's read them. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Nahum and the Syrian. He's referring to two Old Testament stories, famous stories. I put the references on the sheet so you can read them later. The first comes from 1 Kings 17 to set the scene. Ahab is the, is the king of Israel, and he is a complete disaster. Here's the, the summary of his reign in 1 Kings. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And so in judgment, God sends a long drought on the land. And we're not told much about the effect of the drought on Israel, but we are told that in his kindness, God sent his prophet Elijah to the Gentile town of Sidon, uh, to a widow who was literally starving to death. And through Elijah, God blessed her and gave her all of the food that she needed. The story of Naaman comes in 2 Kings 5. Naaman's a, another Gentile, the commander of the army of the king of Syria and a mighty man of valor. But he was also a leper. And leprosy then was a terminal disease. And so Naaman was doomed, it seemed. But for a little servant girl from Israel who was working for Naaman's wife, And she said, if only Naaman could see the prophet Elisha in Samaria, he would definitely be able to cure him of his leprosy. Uh, Naaman was a a proud man. There was a bit of toing and froing. But eventually, when God's prophet Elisha told him to dip himself seven times in the Jordan, he believed him. And the text says, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So there was nothing all that offensive about those stories themselves. But look at the way that Jesus uses them. Verse 25, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up and a great famine came over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. See the emphasis? Elijah wasn't sent to any of the many widows in Israel, but only to a Gentile. Same emphasis in verse 27. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian, the foreigner. So this is a This is a deeply biting warning from Jesus to the synagogue. He's saying, you you lot should be more careful. God has made a habit of taking his blessing away from his own rebellious people when they reject his prophets and giving that blessing to the Gentiles instead. And if you keep on rejecting me, I will do the same. You will miss out on God's salvation and it will go to others instead. See, it's the exact opposite of what they've been wanting to hear when they went to church that morning. They thought that they had a divine right to God's blessing and that the Gentiles would be damned. And here Jesus is saying, you better start listening to me before it's too late. Oh, we don't want to jump ahead too far, but if you've read on in Luke, you'll know that this theme of judgment of Israel, on Israel and blessing to the Gentiles will grow throughout. It's going to be typical of Jesus' ministry. It's one reason the episode is here. But even at this stage, the crowd has heard enough. Did you spot that every single one of them 
in verse 28, is filled with wrath. And so they attempt to kill God's son. And of course, Jesus will die, but it will be when he's ready and on his timing, not theirs. And so verse 30, passing through their midst, he went away. Because God is never a pawn in man's plans, but he is the sovereign ruler of all. Part of the lesson for us is one of expectations. We heard last week that Jesus is sent by God to preach a message of salvation to sinful people. And we might think that when God comes to earth preaching a message of salvation that he will be welcomed with open arms. But we see today that the opposite is true. There is a fundamental conflict between Jesus and the world. There always has been and there always will be. His message was unwelcome then and it will remain unwelcome today. And the big point is that the reaction of the crowds that day therefore confirms the diagnosis of humanity that was delivered by Jesus in our passage last week. Glance back again to verses 18 and 19. They set the theme for so much of what happens in Luke from this moment on. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah, describing his own ministry. But notice the assumption he makes about the condition of humanity apart from his work. He thinks that we are poor. And we saw last week that means spiritually speaking rather than materially. Left to our own devices, you and I are not just a little bit in the red before God, but bankrupt. Again, that we're captives. In John, Jesus once said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And that's Jesus' point here. You'll know that there are loads of things that we cannot do in life. None of us is able to fly without the aid of an engine, I guess. Uh, None of us can run the 100 meters in in five seconds. We, We can't travel in time. We can't avoid death forever. There's many things we can't do. And here Jesus is saying, let's add one to the list. In our own strength... We cannot live to please our maker. We cannot stop ourselves from sinning. We're captives, slaves to sin. He thinks we're blind as well. Uh, Not just a a bit short-sighted, spiritually speaking, and needing some spectacles. But totally unable to work God out. Blind. Oppressed. Oppressed. By nature, we are objects of God's wrath. That's Jesus' diagnosis on all of us and on our world. And I spent some time last week asking us whether we actually believe that truth about ourselves. Can you look in a mirror and say to yourself, right at the core of my own being, apart from God, I am blind, bankrupt, a slave to my sin, and I deserve to face the wrath of God. All true Christianity starts from that point. I've been rereading a book this week called The Sinfulness of Sin, published by a guy called Ralph Venning back in 1699. This is how he describes the way that we've treated our God. He says, our sin is the dare of God's justice. It is the rape of his mercy. It is the jeer of his patience, the slight of his power, the contempt of his love, the upbraiding of his providence, the scoff of his promise, and the reproach of his wisdom. The point is, here is God, the God of grace, extending all of his goodness to us. And we throw it back in his face and reject him. Can we admit that of ourselves? 
but as well as asking whether we admit it of ourselves, I want to ask us this week whether, whether we believe it of those around us. And as I've reflected on it, I think it's a, an even harder question to ask. I've started to think of some of the, the people that I know, and uh, my mind turned immediately to some of the people in our wider family, to some uh, parents we've got to know through the local school, to some of our neighbors. The question is, as I picture their face in my mind, do I believe what Jesus says about them, or do I believe what the world says about them? Do I believe that they're basically good people, on the right track? Or do I believe she is spiritually bankrupt? That he is spiritually blind? That they're objects of God's wrath? Do I actually believe that about them? Or does it just sound a bit too extreme, a bit harsh and overstated? Can I say of my family, my children, that apart from Christ, they are bankrupt? I remember um, arriving to work in Canary Wharf, age 24. It was my first time in London. Um, I'd been asked to try and establish a, a church among the people who worked there. And everywhere I went, people looked so self-assured, so confident, so successful. Uh, many of them had it all. And at times it was pretty intimidating. I think there were, I can't remember if it was 50,000 or 80,000 people who worked there at the time, but I remember asking often, why would ever of the, any of them ever come to church? Someone encouraged me to make myself stand in the middle of Canary Wharf at its busiest point and to watch thousands walking past and to remind myself that they may be earning millions, but that they are bankrupt, that they may look like they're going places. But just like me, apart from Christ, every single one of them is lost. But just like me, apart from Christ, they are slaves to sin. And they are objects of wrath. And that's true of the people that you'll see tomorrow morning. They are dreadfully lost. Of course, only if we believe that about ourselves, will we receive personally the salvation that Jesus offers. And only if we believe that about our world will we give our time and our energies and our money to uniting as a church family behind the great mission of Jesus of preaching salvation to a perishing world. If we think that people are basically okay on their own, we'll give ourselves to meeting their earthly needs. But if we see their real condition, We'll know that their only hope is in Jesus Christ and we'll, give, we'll risk everything and give everything, even our life if necessary, to preach salvation to them. But the point for today is if I'm in any doubt about the real state of the world, I just need to look at the way it treats Jesus. Look at the way he was treated in our passage. There he was offering the world, its only chance of salvation. And they tried to kill him. Here he is today offering salvation to the world. And we bandy his name around as though it was just a piece of excrement. Let's pray. Our Father, we see ourselves very clearly in the synagogue that day. Uh, we know that our natural tendency is not to receive Jesus and his words, but to hate him because he says that we are evil. And so we pray that you would have mercy on us that you would humble us about our own condition before you. Help us never to forget that we are by nature poor, blind and oppressed, slaves to sin. 
Help us, therefore, to grow in our appreciation of Jesus, the one who came to die for us even while we were still sinners. And so convince us of the truth of his diagnosis, we pray, that we would risk and give everything to enable our world to hear about him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.